how we're gonna have the, the pitches and the different competitions uh, that we've been running in the background. Um, it's gonna be an interesting experiment uh, because we're gonna be using some software which is also always a dangerous game to play on a conference. And basically we're also gonna get some interesting information about how different people in the audience are gonna be voting. So we're gonna segment you in different groups. Uh, we're gonna be asking you to vote uh, to, to explain first what kind of category you belong to and then people are gonna be voting for their favorite startups. Uh, we'll see who the winner is and then afterwards we'll see how the distribution was in voting. For instance, do entrepreneurs vote different than, than students? So it would be interesting to, to get that information. Uh, so we're first gonna vote for the startups, then for a sustainable futures challenge and Freddie's gonna be, be talking a bit, a bit more about what, what that was exactly. Then about the iTeams and then we'll do the finalists uh, for the 3D printing innovation award. So basically we're gonna first do this poll for seeing uh, who is involved with what. So basically to, to vote and I'll open up the vote in a second that's still closed so please do not yet send any messages. You can or go to the website polleve.com forward slash qtech. That's actually the most convenient way of doing it. For every uh, poll which is renewed, it will pop up on your screen automatically and you can just click whatever you want to select. Uh, or you can send a free text uh, to that number with the keyword. For instance, here the keywords are TVC investor, TVC others, TVC business. I see that already one person has voted. <laughs> or you can tweet uh, at poll uh, and then also that keyword basically. So a side note because you're gonna be voting for the startups that were around. For those of you who don't have decided yet what your favorite startup is, we still have some of these booklets which have a summary of everything. So if you need one of those booklets quickly now, please raise your hand and Alex will be happy to distribute that. Um, there's for instance one over here. In the meantime, uh, please keep voting and we'll see what the backgrounds of most people who are voting are indeed. Uh, and everybody is of course more than welcome to vote. Also the people who are uh, competing uh, are more than welcome to vote. This is so exciting. It's exciting, isn't it? A bit of audience engagement to wake you up again before uh, getting dinner and everything. If you have any questions or issues, feel free to raise your hand or, or ask some of the the QTEC members for a bit of support. We're happy to help around, of course. And we'll stop doing this poll when, uh, when we don't see the numbers shifting too much anymore. Should we do a routine while we're waiting? A routine? Yeah, like a What's some a sort of comedy routine, a, a dance, I don't know. Freddie is actually, she has a background in, uh, in acting, so she could do a little show while we wait. A monologue, maybe? A monologue. You want to do a monologue? No, oh, sure. of course not. <laughs> but we could give commentary as well. And TVC Academic is in the lead with TVC Business right behind. Oh, and it's moving behind. Just two more points. Oh, what? Up and down. Oh, my gosh. It's so close. It's so close. <laughs> I'm curious who the authors are. Yeah. Media, NGOs. Where are all the investors? We were hoping like at least 60% investors today, right? Okay, do you want to maybe? So I think the numbers might be practically in. There's not that much shifting around anymore. Sometimes it takes a while before the votes get, gets in. And maybe the service isn't so good if so if you're texting. I know I had some problems. Yeah. Okay, I think we, we sort of have an answer more or less. So there's more student academics and then there's entrepreneur and uh, business people uh, running up closely behind. And then we have 10% consultants investors and about 9% of the others. So that's great. And we're going to use this data later as well to analyze how different people have voted for, for the different startups. Uh, I'll maybe give a minute or two to, to get the final, final votes in. If I don't see anything shifting anymore, we'll, we'll continue to the next slide. It's cool, right? It's yeah. cool. Technology. That's why it's the Technology Ventures Conference. Oh, great. So I think we're going to stop the poll here. So thank you for voting. Up to the next vote.
So basically, we have our TVC startup challenge. Um, teams were able, you can start voting actually if you will or, uh, straight away. In the meantime, I'll explain a little bit. We had uh, different teams applying uh, and they were asked to send a, a pretty uh, elaborate sort of summary of, of their business. Most of them were pre-seed. We had a few uh, early seed companies. Um, there was actually one group that dropped out today which was venture number three, Helix. Uh, they couldn't make it unfortunately so they're not in there. Um, so you were able to interact with them. Uh, feel free to also follow up on any conversations you had with them. They're basically happy to talk about collaborations, uh, investment opportunities, of course they're interested in that, but also uh, recruitment or sort of doing small projects for them, they, they will be more than happy uh, to indulge with that as well. So the, the, the top vote is going to be on top, so this is exciting. We have Lobster in the lead together with Hypomatics and Sinclair Fire. Sinclair Fire, Fire taking the lead right now. And basically once we define who the top three startups were or are, then we're gonna ask these startups to quickly put their presentation on the laptop on top. So while I'm analyzing the data, if you will, to see how the distribution of vote was across all the segments, I would ask the top three startups to give their presentation to the AV guys on top. And then once I'm done analyzing the information, you can come down and uh, we'll decide who, who does the first, the first pitch. But I would say the first person does the first pitch, runner up, second pitch, and the third does the third pitch. So it seems like, like it's a bit of a tie be between uh, Hepamedics and Cambridge Molecular Diagnostics. Sinclair Fire seems like they've been taking a bit of a lead. Lobster is getting back in action apparently, so it's exciting to see how things can, can shift very, very quickly. I'm so happy that the system is working and not failing on us because otherwise it would have been an utter mess. <laughs> so we'll, we'll give it a couple more minutes uh, to get the votes that get in late uh, to get them in as well. Uh, because we try to be as fair as possible. Also votes that come out, uh, come from outside this area will be, will be disregarded of course because we don't want anybody uh, who is not here to be voting. And if you see some weird irregularities due to whatever, uh, we'll, we'll follow up on that afterwards and, and uh, potentially disqualify people if they were hacking our system if you will but I don't think people would be that uh, invasive but you never know. Seems like we have a few stable numbers. Uh, lobster, lobster is getting up a little bit. Obviously, you can also vote one time. The system has been set up that it disregards multiple votings. Molecular diagnostic is going to take over again, apparently. Unfortunately, Ariom nucleus and circuit are down on the curve. Seems that we're pretty static at the moment with Lobster and Cambridge Molecular Diagnostics uh, together at, on the lead, but Sinclair Fire seems to be following up. Hippomatics was on the lead initially. What happened to Hippomatics? Maybe one more minute to, to get the last votes in. But it seems like Lobster, Cambridge Molecular Diagnostics, and Sinclair Fire can. Uh, start uploading their presentations upstairs it seems like. Unless there's going to be a last minute takeover by hypomatics or hippomatics. Also they're going to be doing five minute pitches each. Uh, Normally elevator pitches are two to three minutes with Q&A afterwards. We've decided to give them five minutes of time to pitch what they've been doing and what they're focusing on. And we're not going to do any Q&A, but we thought it might be nice to have a full story rather than a very rushy uh, brief summary of what, they're, what they have been doing. So I think we can stop the poll here. And I would uh, first of all congratulate Sinclair Fire, Lobster and Cambridge mo uh, Molecular Diagnostics for, for having first, second and third prize potentially. So. <laughs> so.
So if they could please um, upload their presentations uh, right now and then once they have uploaded their presentations uh, I would kindly want to ask them to, to come down to the stage. In the meantime I'm going to try remotely with my cell phone to analyze the data in real time. Maybe we're being a little bit too tacky today but it's acceptable. So, this is the segmentation. Let's see if we can make any, uh, any sense of it. So we have other, the investors and consultants, the entrepreneurs and the business people, the students and the academics, and then color coded below are the different startups that we've all voted for. So it seems that Sinclair Fire were winners. Uh, Let's say Sinclair Fires, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you can help me out. But Sinclair Fires together with Hippomatics seem to be winning by voting of entrepreneurs and business people, whereas the students and academics voted a bit more for molecular, uh, for Cambridge molecular uh, diagnostics. And then it seems with other that they also mainly voted for Cambridge molecular diagnostics and then the runner up there was Nucleus. And the investors consultants, interestingly, they have a very even spread across all the different startups. So the only people who couldn't really make up their mind were the investors and consultants. That's a bit interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I hope to chat with some of you afterwards to, to find out why that is. But it might be because you all have a very different sort of view on the types of technologies that you're interested in from an investor point of view, right? If you're interested in water, why would you vote for a company that does I don't know, uh, some, some social networking or something like that, right? I don't know if you can publish a paper afterwards with this data, but I think the, the amount of people was a little bit too low to the statistics. But anyway, it's fun. That's why we're doing this. Um, how many presentations do we have up? Three already? Okay, wonderful. So if the startups can. Okay, that's wonderful. Yeah, take your time, take your time. I think the AV guys hate me for, uh, for this, which is a, a bit of a logistical mess, but we make it work. Does anybody have any suggestions maybe why there was such a big spread around the investors, entrepreneurs, maybe anybody has a comment, uh, maybe some of the investors themselves, please, please give a shout if you, if you want to comment. Yes please, Mike. Mike can talk without Mike or with Mike. Investors never make a decision quickly. That's very true. How can, how can we change this? We need to change this, right? Would we? Well, they need more time to do their due diligence. You know? That's very true. That's very true. But then again, the consultants do due diligence, so they should make rapid decisions. No? I don't know. I would suggest once the first presentation is up, the people who have put that presentation up can, can come down. And basically to explain a little bit uh, about the further steps, so after this we have the people from the Sustainable Futures Challenge. I want to talk about that but I'm going to leave that to Freddy because uh, within QTEC we came up with this idea of doing the Sustainable Futures Challenge and it was Freddy who sort of piloted this project and brought it forward so I want to give the honor to her to further explain what we've done for that. Um, and for that we first gonna have them do a pitch and then you can vote because there's just three teams. So they're gonna give a five minute presentation, all three of them, and then you can vote for them afterwards. And then for the I teams there's gonna be, uh, there were ten teams as well. We're gonna be doing voting to select the best one. That's gonna be the winner straight away. Uh, and their team uh, then has the opportunity to give a short pitch of five minutes as well to show uh, what they've been doing. We would love to give everybody the opportunity to pitch uh, for five minutes but that would be a full day uh, by itself so unfortunately we couldn't do that. So it seems that Sinclair Fire uh, is first up. 
So if the Sinclair fire people would please come down to the stage. Um, yeah, give him an applause, give him an applause. <laughs> and you can decide or you use the lectern or mic, yeah, that's fine. Uh, you can use it like this or just plug it in, um, that's completely fine. I'll be keeping track of the time and I'll single you when we're about five minutes in. Um, and then, yeah, you have 10 seconds, 15 seconds to wrap that up. Okay. That's okay. Let me see, where's my stopwatch? Here we go. Okay, up to you, okay. please. All good. Right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is James Popper, and I am Managing Director of Sinclair Fire. Uh, we provide fire detection solutions for the home. So, about five years ago, an elderly family friend left a pan on the hob. She had the onset of dementia and she completely forgot about it. Left the building, half an hour later, the kitchen had been destroyed by fire. Kitchen fire safety is a significant issue. In fact, in the UK each year, 68% of all fires start in the kitchen. And these cost on average about 10 and a half thousand pounds worth of fire damage. Current detection solutions are inadequate. So you've got heat detectors, they're really, really slow to respond to fires. And you've got smoke alarms, which I'm sure as many of you are aware, have the problems of nuisance false alarms. So the solution is the Sinclair Kitchen Fire Detector. It utilizes patent granted infrared analysis technology to be able to pick up on fires quickly and effectively. This means that we're able to detect the difference between different types of fires. And crucially, we can say, in one type of fire is a gas hob, one type of fire is a dangerous kitchen fire, and we can do that really, really quickly, in under 30 seconds. And that allows us to reduce those response times by up to two minutes. And crucially, that drives down the cost of fire damage by up to 30%. And as I said, that's about three and a half thousand pounds worth of fire damage, which is obviously quite significant. On the flip side, we don't have the problems of nuisance false alarms as well that current detection solutions have. So, with this detection technology, we've basically gone through and we've done a lot of independent testing and um, independent trials as well. So, on the actual fire testing side of things, we've been working with BSI to get our independent kite mark, and we hope to do that within the next month. And we've also been doing trials at Trinity College Cambridge undergraduate accommodation. And as you can imagine, that's probably the, probably the best place to test for false alarms in student kitchens. And actually, surprisingly, in the last, well, interestingly, in the last nine months, we've actually found that there have been no false alarms with our detection technology with the 20 detectors we've had in. And so, our two key main markets that we're going to target at the moment are social housing and residential property development. This is because, by law, you've got to put a mains pad heat detector in all new or materially altered kitchens. And so, we plan to sell our product directly into that space. On the social housing side of things, there are 4.7 million social housing dwellings and affordable dwellings in the UK. And of these, about half are controlled by local authorities and large social housing firms. And it's, the product is perfect for them because of the problems they face with kitchen fires in terms of the increased incidence. So on average, they have a 1.5% incidence of kitchen fires in their social housing stock. And that represents about eight million pounds worth of self-insured fire damage each year. And obviously that's a significant amount of money that they could be spending for the use and um, for the welfare of their residents. So our detection technology, as I said, allows them to reduce that bill by 30%, whilst making the lives of their residents safer and more secure. On the residential property side of things, we plan to sell in at the initial time of build as well. And there's about 160,000 homes built in the UK each year, of which 40% are built by just five developers. So a great market to be able to launch into. In terms of the development that we've done up until this point, as I said, we've created a product, we've created the casing for the product, and we have a finalized unit ready to go into manufacture. And we just bought our set, first set of injection mold tools and are gearing up for manufacture and launch in August. We've got our first order, which is with one of the UK's largest social housing firms, and that's for 3,000 units. But the reason why I'm here today, ladies and gentlemen, is because I'm asking for your assistance to help me take the product to the next stage. We've been self-funded up until this point through loans um, and grants, 
and the £5,000 will allow us to carry out the final bit of independent testing and fulfil those 3,000 units of orders. In short, your help today will allow us to put these devices in the homes that are most vulnerable and make fire detection smarter, faster and safer. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not sure who's next up. I think we'll see that when the, when the presentation appears. Indeed. Wonderful, good job. Please, do you need any help or that's gonna work? No, it should work. Wonderful, you can also keep it like a mini mic or clip it on if you want. No. So, next up, Lobster. Can you hear me well? Is it on? It's on, yeah. Where's so, that clicker? Please start. Hi, I'm Olga, CEO and co-founder of Lobster. And we're building the world's honest place to find and license content from social media. In my times between university and MBA and Lobster, I've done a lot of corporate marketing jobs. And all I could find when I was looking for images would look as standard as this. And that would cost me 100 pounds and more. And we all have this problem when we're preparing our university works, our investor pitches, our marketing materials. We can then go online and find content from real people. And that's 1.8 billion people creating for us in every corner of the earth, but we can't use their photos and videos because it's illegal. There is an IP right that belongs to the user and he deserves to be rewarded. To solve this, we have created Lobster the social content marketplace. In a very slick and beautiful interface, you can search by keywords, geolocations, and dates for photos and videos from users who just sign up once with their Instagram or Flickr or YouTube, Facebook, Twitter account, you name it, wherever they are, and make their content available to you to license it. So when you found what you were looking for, you can just buy it in a few clicks with PayPal account and they will get 75% of all the revenues immediately into their account. And you get the photo and the royalty-free worldwide license at a price of one to three dollars. What's more amazing, and why TechCrunch has recently called us the Google for social media content, is that we can now search all of the public accounts everywhere by the same keywords, geolocations, and dates, and then enable you to request whoever it is in the world to license their photo to you. And we automatically connect you to this person, and they have a choice to opt in or opt out. And if they opt in, you get the photo. You may be wondering still what's so different about this. There are so many photo platforms. But we're creating a really sustainable platform. We're taking a lot of this content that cannot be used legally right now and benefiting from this tens of billions, at least, of photos and videos making it available to you, as opposed to some apps that also work on user-generated content, but they compete with these platforms for users, creating yet another pool of content, whereas we make what is already available in every corner of the earth licensable for you. We estimated this market on the buyer side at $5 billion in photos and videos, and that's the market we're targeting. With our current business model, that's as simple as 25% commission on every transaction, creating also subscription for large corporate accounts like BBDO, for example, one of our trial customers, uh, and enabling these big advertising agencies source content from real people that appeal to real consumers in the real world. And then as a second segment that we're targeting, uh, we have B2C platforms like Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, all of the platforms where we as people make something Prezi as well, uh, which I'm sure many of us know. And then we enable people that build something there to buy photos, uh, images, graphics, videos from other people on social media when they're building these websites. And that's a huge, a uh, number of websites. Wix alone is 50 billion websites a year that are built. And then finally, blogs and media. Mashable is one of our um, trial customers as well. And for them, it's like a huge newsroom created 
uh, by people in the world where they can see what's going on in real time through Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, and then get the photo from the user whenever they want to, to actually create a material about that and show the world what's going on there. It's a live product that is launched on TechCrunch Disrupt Battlefield in London, October last year. And since then, we have grown to half a million photos and videos in the database from a few uh, thousand of users that actively post these photos to their loved so social networks. And we've got four agencies that are trialing um, and subscribing to use that content. That all has been possible thanks to our brilliant team, part technical, scientific, part marketing, and an award-winning UX designer who's won a PC Mag Awards and Mac Awards for her previous work. And thanks to our advisors, um, these people make our introductions to the whole uh, media industry to connect people. And we next raise in a 500,000 pound round uh, but we also um, created a campaign like an ice bucket challenge uh, to make people around the world aware that IP rights for social media content belong to authors and that it's no good stealing others' photos. And if we win 5,000 pounds today, this is what we're going to fund with. Uh, making the whole world aware. And by giving this 5,000 pounds to us, stopping. you invest in the new world of finding and licensing social media content. <laughs> and actually, thank you. Thank you very much. One thing I forgot to say, the whole presentation is actually made with photos that we bought from real people on Flickr and Instagram, in case you like them. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then please, the last team, um, that was Cambridge Molecular Diagnostics, if I don't remember that wrong. So, congratulations, c congratulations for being here. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, let me set up my timer again. So I need to use my memory help. Memory. <clears throat> Good, please. Well, thank you very much for all your votes. Uh, well, uh, we are Cambridge Molecular uh, Diagnostics. Uh, my name is Gustavo Cerda Moya, and I'm the CEO and the inventor of the technology. So, it's, uh, sorry, how did I? Thank you. Uh, well, it's expected that by 2050, uh, <clears throat> multi-resistant infections will kill more people than cancer, and with a huge cost of uh, one, sorry, one T, um, trillion uh, pounds a year. So currently, uh, the principal uh, expansion of the antibiotic resistances is due to, to the in, uh, inaccurate use of antibiotics. 50% of the antibiotics that are prescribed are not meant to be as uh, effective as, as pre prescri uh, prescribed. And this uh, has uh, substantially contributed to, to the spread of the multibiotic resistances uh, infections. Uh, so the, the current cost uh, for uh, multibiotic resistance infection, sorry, um, uh, is uh, 1.5 uh, billion uh, pounds in UK, and in US can be as big as 30 billion pounds. So we strongly believe that we need to change the way how you, uh, we use antibiotics, and uh, that's why uh, that was the motivation for us to provide the technology to allow uh, the right use of antibiotics. So we have debe developed this uh, novel technology uh, that allows the manufacture of self-contained self units uh, like this one, which mimics the simplicity of a pregnancy test. So you can perform diagnostic uh, on, on, bio on, bi on biological samples uh, at the GP surgery. So <clears throat> this, uh, uh, this technology, uh, sorry, is there any pointer here? Well, this uh, technology allows you to perform genetic tests uh, in 15 minutes, uh, and it's very easy to use, well, fairly inexpensive, and uh, doctors can treat, uh, know the susceptibility of the infection within 15 minutes. And the best of thing is, since everything is contained on this unit, you don't need any expensive um, uh, unit, uh, device to use the technology, and it's disposable. So the, uh, the technology is very versatile and can be uh, tailored for other uses. Uh, so we are looking for uh, licensing partners to develop other kind of uh, diagnostic devices to 
uh, diagnose uh, viruses, uh, other pathogens uh, to expand uh, to the food industry. But more importantly, uh, this technology uh, can uh, uh, allow, uh, can provide a, a, a very low cost alternative for uh, developing countries. So <clears throat> the current market uh, of diagnostics uh, is uh, 30, well, uh, no, the, the current market of diagnostic is, is very big, but molecular diagnostic is a very small proportion of this. Uh, and if we, uh, uh, if we extrapolate uh, the market with the current technologies, uh, in three years' time, uh, it will reach the six billion pounds uh, market. But with this technology, we can further expand to 18 billion. But more importantly, we can explore uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, we can explore an, uh, uh, the, the developing countries market, which is fairly uh, uh, unexplored. So uh, this technology has a lot of potential. Um, <clears throat> so, so far we have uh, proved the concept of this technology. Uh, we can detect uh, laboratory samples very in very, uh, very short period of time. Uh, we have licensed, uh, sorry, uh, file the, the patent uh, for the technology. Um, well, uh, we will use this award to further develop the technology and to build a demonstration prototype so we can demonstrate the, the, the technology to investors and uh, license it, uh, so, and also to attract investors to, to further develop the multi-resistant, uh, sorry, multi-resistant bacteria diagnostic uh, kit. Uh, yeah, so, uh, as I already say, some some of the, the things uh, the, the plans uh, the immediate plans is to 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 demonstrate the technology to investors, uh, but in the long term we would like to license it and well obtain the regulatory uh, approvals for for this technology to be used uh, at the GP surgery. So, yeah. thank you very much. Okay, we have the three pitches right now. So if we could switch back to, uh, to the QTech presentation with the voting system, we can open the votes up again. Um, I don't know, in the meantime, I would say to all the three startups, please join me on stage to observe the numbers changing so we can congratulate you straight away. No. This is wrong for some reason. Mm -mm -mm. Let me see. So here's the items. Here's the Sustainable Futures Challenge. So don't vote, please, uh, right now. Um, yeah, there are some things that switched around. Let me see. Where is part two? Uh, uh, um. Let me think. Sustainable future challenge, iTeams. iTeams again. This is it? Yeah, I don't know why it switched around. And I also deleted the ones that should not be there. So basically just vote for Lobster Sinclair Fire and for uh, uh, Molecular Diagnostics, so Venture 2. Some people making some interesting votes. <laughs> more people confused, apparently. Even more. Or maybe some people think all three of them were bad. No, don't say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Sinclair Fire seems to be catching up with Lobster a little bit. Let's see what's happening there. So we're also going to be sending out all the submissions and the business plans, basically, that the different teams submitted to us 
to all the investors in the audience. So there was a question A from the startups and a question B also from the investors that were here today. So we're gonna share the, or exchange the information basically to also help all of the startups. I'm not only talking about the, the top three ones, but all 10 that were here today, to help them out uh, to, to find the right investors and also to sort of elevate and accelerate their company um, and find some capital for, for doing the things they want to be doing in the next couple of years. So Lobster still seems to be slightly ahead of the curve. Not much changing anymore, so it's going to be tricky to decide at what point we're going to stop. Bit of change. Let's give it one more minute just to be 100% sure because we don't want to make any wrong decisions here. In the meantime, I can start commenting on the prizes they're gonna get. We're not gonna be offering the prizes right here, so we're gonna discuss with them uh, the prizes they're gonna be obtaining. Obviously, the winner is gonna go home with uh, 5,000 uh, pounds cash money, which will be transferred to them after the conference. Uh, and then we have different prizes which will be spread out over the three uh, startups. And the winner can pick their favorite and then the runner-up can pick their favorite uh, of the prizes and then the third one can take what's left basically. Um, and we have one prize that is for everybody which is basically half a year of uh, office space and ID space uh, here in Cambridge. So that's a nice prize. I think uh, courtesy, to, uh, courtesy of Stu McTravis uh, who's running ID space. And then we have mentorship prizes. Uh, so we have mentors that are gonna be mentoring these startups for a year. Uh, one day a month. This can be live or this can be over Skype or something like that. Um, we have Stu McTravis from Ideaspace. Again, a big thank you to him for doing this. Then we also have Jose who was gonna, we was talking about uh, engineering today from MIT, uh, who's also one of our advisors at QTech. He's gonna be taking up uh, one of these um, mentoring uh, positions as well. And then we also have John Bradford, uh, who is currently the director at, uh, at Techstars, uh, the big accelerator in London is also going to be mentoring uh, one of these three teams. So, already a big congratulations to everybody because they were big, like very nice prizes, we think. Uh, and then finally, we also have consulting prizes. So, three consulting prizes, which is going to be one uh, consulting session basically. And we have AMO Venture Capital Advisory. They're going to give out one prize, so one consulting session from AMO for one of the teams. And then uh, we have uh, Imperial Innovations. They're also going to do uh, a venture capital advisory session. So Inga was talking about healthcare. She's part of Imperial Innovation, uh, for instance. And then the last prize is about uh, legal advice and intellectual property, which has been offered by Methods and Squire, uh, a legal IP firm uh, based in London. Um, I'm not sure. I can't see the numbers anymore, but I think Lobster is still ahead by sort of a millimeter, maybe a percent or so. I hope it's not going to get to a tie because that would be annoying. We're not going to split the prize money, are we? What do you think, guys? Should we stop the poll? Did anything move? Nothing moved. So, Lobster, congratulations. <laughs> oh. What happened? Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Lobster. Ah, oh, no. Fuck. This is interesting. Okay, in this situation, I would still give it like one minute just to be 100% sure. I'm so sorry, Lobster. I'm so sorry, Lobster. This is sort of the advantage, but also the disadvantage of technology. It's really unpredictable, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, you've actually gone down by 2% compared to Sinclair Fire. Come on, Lobster. If, if lobster loses, we're gonna have lobster for dinner tonight, I guess. <laughs> um, oh. 
it's a tie again. I'm saying but when it changes one more time, we're gonna decide on the winner. It's stop, it's lobster again. Okay, it's lobster. I'm gonna put it off right now to not have any changes. So lobster again, congratulations. <laughs> Please come to the stage and say maybe two words. We can shake a hand for the picture so that you can put this up to on your social media platform or something like that. We don't have a big fake check, but we will do, we will give you the money and we'll communicate about this afterwards. <laughs> so first a handshake for the camera. So congratulations. Well just a couple of words. Thank you. It was a thrill actually. Uh, thank you for making it so exciting. Thank you for your voice. Uh, as I said, we'll be running like um, sort of an ice bucket challenge to, to actually engage people in a viral way to, to make them understand the IP rights for social media content, for yours and ours social media content. So we'll invite you to participate. We we'll look forward to that. And thanks once again to everyone. So next up is, so there's something a little bit wrong with my slides, but we'll figure this out. Uh, let's see, so next is the Sustainable Futures Challenge. So Freddie's gonna give a brief introduction about this. So for the Sustainable Future Challenge teams that have not put their presentations up on the computer yet, please do that now. And then once you're ready, please uh, start coming to the stage. In the meantime, I'll clear uh, this one, one vote away. <laughs> Guys, you're not supposed to vote until they actually give the pitches. Come on now. Um, <laughs> uh, the SFC, or the Sustainable Futures Challenge, is something that Jerome and I have been working on since August last year. We got together and we wanted to create a startup challenge that wasn't a startup challenge. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to um, bring together the immense intellectual capital that we have here at Cambridge and get different people from different departments really to work together towards solving one single problem. And we didn't, most startup challenges, you, you already have a group of people who've been working together a long time. They've already got an idea. They've already got funding maybe, you know, and we felt like it was a bit unfair for those people who wanted to do something innovative and who wanted to be on a team, but you know, are, are busy working on their PhDs and, and things like that. So the, and we wanted it also to be solving problems that are going to affect humans' um, survivability on the planet. We wanted it to be s something sustainable. So we got together with NIAB, our sponsor, the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, and they gave us some of what they thought were the biggest challenges face it, that they've seen. And those were uh, soil structure, uh, compost, and uh, cover crop seed sizes, which you'll, you'll hear a bit more about in the pitches. And we had 25 people apply. We put them on teams. Uh, I'm really, really proud of them. They, over the last two months, have, have not only come up with really innovative ideas uh, to the problems we've presented to them, but they've also even come up with business plans and, and started forming businesses, which I think is, is really awesome. And um, do we have, who, who's, do we have uh, the presentations up there? They're gonna, they're gonna give five minutes each uh, to tell you a little bit about their project, their problem, and their business that they've come up with, and then the winners uh, get free tickets to our dinner tonight at Trinity Hall, plus office space at the Future Business Center, so they can work on their, further build their business here in Cambridge. Are, are they up there? Yeah, why don't we start having our teams come down to the front if you... Okay, so yeah, please. Yeah, all right, your but... Is up and everything is ready. Um, yeah, do we have the presentations though? That's what we're waiting on. So I'll just fill you in while we're waiting. The Sustainable Futures Challenge people have had two workshops before now. The first was to have a roundtable discussion with an expert in the problem and come up with, just brainstorm with, uh, we put MBAs, we put biochemical engineers, we put regular engineers, we put um, plant scientists, different types of people onto teams. 
And then they had three weeks to come up with an idea and come back for um, a panel of business experts who gave them some ideas on how they could turn it into a business, what was financially feasible, give them more feedback on their pitching. And, um, and then now here they are with a five minute pitch. And do you, <laughs> it seems our first team is going to be APIS, which was solving the problem of, oh, nope, no it's not. Yeah, all right, sorry, yeah. Seems that our first team is going to be uh, Entem Entemos, which is going to be solving the problem of organic waste. Yeah. Sure, thank you everyone. So we came into this challenge with a very specific focus on solving a particular problem that we're all pretty familiar with, and that is the fact that every year in the UK, we waste around 15 million tonnes of food waste which mostly ends up in landfills. This is about nine Wembley stadiums up to the brim, so it's a pretty significant issue, which leads to increased disposal costs for taxpayers, increased greenhouse gas emissions, environmental issues around landfill sites, but most importantly, it's an inefficient use of the residual value and energy in this food waste. So waste is really just a resource in the wrong place at the, in the, wrong, place at the wrong time. So metals, paper and plastics, there's pretty well established commercial recycling operations aimed at transforming these materials back into products. Food's a bit more difficult. It's hard to transform food waste back into human consumable food. So the other alternatives to this problem, such as compost, it's very hard to be commercially viable. You need very large scale, there's very small profit margins, and a big urban to rural logistical challenge. Things like um, anaerobic digestion, even the more novel methods, it's actually very hard to um, scale this up. It's very capital intensive. Even things like animal feed in the UK. Regulatory issues actually prohibit this from being widely adopted. Things like um, it's, very, it's actually illegal to feed post-customer kitchen waste to pigs and livestock in this country. So we actually came up with a different solution. Right, so what if I told you that there is a way to convert all of this food waste into a range of resources? And you know, this way, coincidentally, it happens to be sustainable, highly scalable, and economically feasible. So here at Entomos, what we're trying to do is to convert food waste to resources using insects. Specifically, this guy over here, the black soldier fly. So, the black soldier flies are not always fly, so they start off a large one, which you can see in the upper corner, and you can also see them afterwards in the networking session. We've got some with us. Um, and these larvae are able to eat most of your everyday food waste and convert it into larval biomass. So, you might be you know, asking yourself, cool, you're going to get a lot of larvae, but what to do with these? We think we can convert them into biodiesel or as we like to call it, fly or diesel. <laughs> so the, the black soldier fly larvae are about 40% fat uh, content when dried, which means that after the fat is extracted, it can be easily converted into biodiesel in an automatable two-step reaction. So just, you know, as a rough figure, uh, one metric ton of larvae can produce about 150 liters of biodiesel, but that is not all. We're not planning to do our business you know, with only one product. There's a lot of side products produced in this process, as you can see here, uh, liquid fertilizer, compost byproducts, and after fat extraction, the leftover can, is a source of, you know, high protein and can be used as animal feed. And in addition, over time, we want to explore additional, you know, secondary metabolites potentially found in these larvae and use them hopefully in chemical and biomedical industries. But there's a lot of you know, benefits about this approach. It's quite something novel, but let's just focus on the biodiesel one. Currently, biodiesel is being made either from used cooking oil or from oil produced specifically from crops grown to produce the biodiesel. And you know, when you're using lard, which can be used for foods to produce fuels, that's kind of a no-no. In our approach, waste is converted into biodiesel. In addition, you know, the greenhouse gas emission of these larvae is only a fraction of that produced by common livestock. So what we're trying to do here is create a new sustainable way to generate biofuels. So the market opportunity is actually quite significant here because there's a lot of support from the EU and the UK government around promoting biofuels as, as opposed to traditional, traditional fossil fuel based fuels. Um, the UK biofuel capacity today is about 1.5 billion litres. That's around you know, 3 to 5% of the overall conventional diesel usage in the country today. 
But importantly, things like the RTFO, the Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation Scheme, means that all major fuel providers in the UK must source 5% of their fuel stock from cleaner sources like biofuels. So there's actually a big government support here that's actually quite, quite intriguing. In addition, any fuel from the waste products which we're using can be double counted, so it's doubly as valuable to these kind of companies. We want to partner with the University of Cambridge and local organisations first, but ultimately the end customers would be the large fuel organisations and specifically companies like Tesco and Sainsbury's. Imagine having a supermarket partner where you take their food waste at the start and then actually help them to sell uh, locally sourced biodiesel at the very end of their products in Sainsbury's and Tesco's branded fuel stations. So again, com compelling business model, and in terms of commercialisation, we think the next step over the summer is to build a small pilot plant to test the technological vi viability, and ultimately to build a 70,000 litre feasibility factory within 18 months using grant funding, about £280,000, which we think can help to get some customer traction and really prove that this is a, a really viable way to generate a commercial, sustainable and organic product that we think is going to be really interesting. So thank you for listening. Awesome, right? Thank you so much for that presentation on Flyo Diesel. Our next Sustainable Futures Challenge team is. <laughs> yes, is Apis, who's. Uh, their problem was the problem of soil structure and crop health. So before, without further ado, Peter is going to tell us all about that. Oh, yes, here's your thing. <clears throat> okay. And do you, if you want to walk yeah, around, can I? yeah, just put that in your pocket. And hold on to this or clip it to you. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Um, my name's Peter. <clears throat> I'm here with the Soil Structure team and we're presenting APHIS to you. So the problem we're facing is essentially to feed the world. There are 75 million people born every year, but the amount of land we're creating every year is not matching that increase, which means we need to increase yield per area. However, we can't do this without damaging the soil because we're already overusing fertilizers and pesticides and as we're constantly seeing in the news there's always negative impacts of these products. So what we can do is reduce the losses from things we know are happening and the two sources we've identified are soil compaction and crop disease. Now the 30% figure I've written here is for crop disease alone. Um, that's the most prominent disease in the UK and it's a study by Bayer crop science. The problem is, and the reason they haven't been treated before this, is because they're hard to detect and they're even harder to treat. <clears throat> now the solution we're presenting is to micromanage every plant. If you ever run a greenhouse or if you've been in a, um, in a patch where you grow a few, a few crops, then you know that these things that I've just said to you are not really a problem because you can deal with them quickly and you know what's happening. We need to bring this to the farmer. So the first step of our solution is to use autonomous drones. Now, this is really the secondary technology of APHIS. The primary technology is step two. We're going to use the images that the drones capture and convert them to soil moisture maps using machine learning algorithms. And we take that one step further, and we use expert knowledge programs to automate the process of using experts to tell you where you should apply your fertilizer, where you should apply your pesticides, and when you should go on the field to minimize soil compaction. The name Apis comes from the genus of the honeybee. And the reason uh, we decided to give it that was because bees are seen as the good insect. Everyone loves bees. Um, <laughs> so we're the good company. Now, Apis is an end-to-end -end service. Um, that's what we're really trying to provide. A lot of the other competitors just provide you with the images. They don't provide you with the interpretation or the maps. The potential for commercialization is here. So the prototype that we've made, um, the prototype you see here, costs 250 pounds to make. With custom manufacturing, we can probably get that down to 200 pounds. And the 18,000 figure I've written here 
is from a 30% loss on a 50 hectare field, which is what we're targeting, and there are 34,000 of those in the UK alone. The low cost to create the, the drone and the docking station, which we're also proposing, um, means that we can also export to foreign markets and third world countries, which actually I know a lot of you have come up to me today and suggested. And the last point I want to make is that um, our aim with APIS is, is to change the world. Um, it seems ambitious, but really that's, that's what I want to do. Um, we need to shift agriculture to higher precision, less wasteful methods if we want to move on sustaining the growth that we've created. This is just a quick sketch of the docking station I mentioned. Um, we've tentatively named the drone the B and the docking station the Hive. Um, so it runs on an external solar panel, but it could also run on any other power source, um, such as biogas. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. And our last team, uh, perhaps the most uh, decorated team, uh, was solving the problem of cover cropping, uh, seed size distribution, which surely they will explain to you, and they can do it better than I can. But here uh, I present Smart Seeds. So, old MacDonald has a farm, and on his farm, he plants cover crops. What are cover crops? Cover crops are fast-growing plants that farmers plant after harvesting their initial cash crop and before sowing their next cash crop. Why do they do this? For environmental benefits. So, it helps prevent soil erosion prevents water contamination, but also adds additional benefits to the soil for the next crop. Um, currently, there's economic incentive for Old MacDonald to keep sowing cover crops. EU policy that was released in October 2014 states that 5% of all farmland should be cover cropped. Germain's, a multinational seed company, predicts that cover crop seed sales will increase by 50% this year. But Old MacDonald has a problem. Cover crops are all different shapes and sizes, like people. And each cover crop, um, each type of cover crop, adds specific benefit to the soil, which means that they come from different sized seeds. So some big seeds and some small seeds. And so using current farming machinery, it's really difficult for Old MacDonald to sow these seeds evenly across the field and for the field to get even benefits. He needs a smarter way to sow. He needs smart seed and not this dumb seed. So what are smart seeds? Smart seeds are multi-pelleted seeds. Each smart seed contains about four cover crop seeds, neatly encapsulated in a nutrient-enriched gel. This gel dissolves in the soil to distribute the seeds, but also to add additional benefits. So a big bag of dumb seed can be replaced by a much smaller bag of uniform-sized and nutrient-enriched smart seeds. It's essentially the multivitamin for cover crop seeds. Smart Seeds is more than just a product. It is a complete solution. Uh, farmers have no learning curve. They can use existing distribution systems, and we also use existing optimized technology to manufacture the seeds. Um, 
our seeds, our smart seeds, are made with recyclable materials. And this solves not only the problem of um, water pollution, etc., but also on top of that, it helps mitigate the problem of waste management in the UK. And we also provide a service, and this service to farmers helps, helps them have match their needs to our smart seeds. We help them have different packages tailored to their needs. So in case they want to increase their nutrition for the soil, such as nitrates, we have a smart seed for that. If they want to reduce soil erosion, we have a smart seed for that. So we provide a whole new level of user experience for the farmers. Okay, so the estimated market size is approximately 2 million hectares. Our financial projections are based on the sum of 250,000 pounds. Uh, though in future additional funding rounds might be necessary to increase the market penetration and fight the copycat problem. We're looking to achieve approximately uh, 190,000 pounds EBITDA by first quarter of 2017. Our primary expenditures are related to market research, marketing, product manufacturing and IT service development. Our team consists of Cambridge entrepreneurs and uh, scientists. In our advisory board there is a leading UK cover crop expert and one angel investor. What does the market think about it? We made two on-field trips on agri-conferences both in Norfolk and Cambridge. And according to our survey, 19 out of 20 farmers love smart seeds. Current market needs an effective, simple, accessible solution for cover cropping. Smart seeds renovate customer experience in cover cropping, satisfy current market need, and makes a significant contribution to UK agriculture development. Make a smart choice, vote for smart seeds. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. And we're not just saying that because they were coached by us. But. <laughs> so if we can have the, have the voting system back up, we're going to do a next round of voting. Hope you're not tired of all the voting by now. So, please, feel free to vote. And just to reiterate, the winners of uh, this get free tickets to the dinner tonight and office space at the Future Business Center. Courtesy of Paul Hodges. Yes. I hope it's not going to be more or less a tie again. Yeah. Um, well maybe next year we should just have like a time limit. Can you do like a time limit? In the meantime, this might be a good opportunity to also thank our sponsors. Uh, that way I don't have to do that in the end and we can go to the dinner quicker. Um, so we have a bunch of gold sponsors, silver sponsors and bronze sponsors. So we're very, very happy that they support us because without them, this would uh, of course not be possible. Uh, as I said, we are um, a not-for-profit organization, so we depend on sponsorship. So we're incredibly thankful to organizations such as Carpe Diem, and it was actually Darren Disley who, who gave us a, a very big support. Uh, Founders.org have been supporting us for two years as well, so we're very happy with, uh, with the kind collaboration there. And Matty Muin have also been uh, a long-term sponsor uh, for us, so we hope that we can keep up these good relations. And we hope that we can also do a lot uh, of work together with them next year. Uh, maybe do some, um, some ideation uh, sessions with students. Uh, this is something that some of these partners are sometimes interested in. Uh, to organize events with us, for instance, to qu ask a question to the Cambridge students who can help them innovate uh, some part of their R&D. And I also want to thank Ultimaker. We're going to be talking a little bit in the end about the 3D printing competition, uh, the EPSRC, 
and then also Ammo, uh, the Future Business Center, Mattis and Squire, and NIAP. And NIAP was actually the main sponsor for this Sustainable Futures uh, Challenge. So a big thank you to all of them. It seems that we're all fairly close to each other again. I think the compost challenge has been on top the whole time. No? Soil structure. It's getting very interesting. It's a very even split. That means that you all did a great job, guys. It makes it a little bit more annoying for us, so. If it's really going to be an even split, I have to reconsult with the future business center to see if they can all give you a seat there. Seed distribution and taking over. Let's give it a minute or so. Of course, the system is set up to be fail proof, but we'll be checking the results afterwards so that nobody cheated, of course. But we hope you didn't. We hope you didn't. I think it feels like we're coming to a bit of a standstill right now, which is good for us. Not so good for team one and two. You think it's time to congratulate the seed distribution team? I think it is. Congratulations to the seed distribution team. Where's the seed distribution guys? Do you want to say a thank you? No? No? Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. So basically the last thing to do before we get to the 3D printing is the iTeams challenge. I don't know if the slides are frozen, but I can't, ah, here we go, yeah. Um, so iTeams, so somebody voted already, so please start voting. In the meantime, I can describe uh, what the iTeams are. iTeams is actually, um, it takes place uh, mainly in West Cambridge uh, in the Hauser Forum, uh, no, in the uh, Institute for Manufacturing. And basically what they do, it's, uh, it's a Cambridge organization, Cambridge University organization. And if you're a scientist or an innovator at Cambridge University and you think you have developed a very good piece of technology with potential uh, commercial applications, you can apply and give your concept to the people who manage iTeams. They will set forward a project which is open for students to apply to. So basically they're gonna ask students and academics from all backgrounds uh, to work on this project, uh, to analyze the market and to try and come up with a business model uh, whereby they can sort of um, make use of this, this technology that has been uh, invented at the university. Obviously sometimes there's failure, sometimes there's success. There's one big success story from uh, a QTech uh, alumnus, uh, Jerome, who was also doing one of the workshops today. He was part of the I teams and they took a piece of technology for, for uh, scaling up carbon, um, no, graphene production. And uh, yeah, their business is doing very well. So sometimes there are great success stories in this. So these are some of the teams that have been um, working on their project this year. 
Um, every term there's a, a set of projects and this year we, we also wanted to give them a chance to pitch what they've been working on here at the TVC. Um, and the top team um, will get also free, free access to our dinner today. So here it seems that it's more of a, a less, uh, less competitive apparently. It seems that team two is doing pretty well with creating uh, the hydrogen economy using small scale hydro generators. So if I remember right, those teams are trying to get um, hydrogen storage to, to the houses in the same way that Simon is trying to get batteries to the houses. Seems that uh, the hydrogen economy team is still ahead. We'll give it a, a minute or so. Um, but there has to be a big overtaking if we still want to see change here, I think. I think we might be able to conclude that team two, yes? Let me see. Did you vote already? No? Because if you have voted, then the system will stop. Okay. What do you think? Can we conclude that team two has won? Yes, let's conclude. Congratulations, team two. <laughs> Is team two somewhere to be found? Yes. Please give your presentation to them. You're welcome to give a five minute sort of summary uh, about what you've been doing, and then we'll move to, to Paul uh, from Ultimaker to announce the 3D printing winners. And then finally, to wrap up this, uh, this very information dense and tiring I can imagine day we have uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey who's going to be talking about how to be success, a successful heretic um, which is good if you want to be an innovator and if you want to disrupt certain industries and uh, I presume Dr. de Grey considers himself as an heretic otherwise he wouldn't be giving this presentation but I'm very curious to, to see what he's going to say. With regards to the people who are going to the dinner afterwards, so we said that we would start the reception at um, 7.30 and the dinner would start around uh, 8. Uh, we'll try to give you some more room. Uh, we'll try to extend the reception by 15 uh, minutes if the people of Trinity Hall would allow us to do that, which would be good. Um, so let's hope that we can wrap up uh, this event around 6. Oh, seven. I'm sorry. Yeah. They are preparing themselves. Wonderful. Also, independent on the fact on whether or not you're an investor or not, feel free, of course, to, to reach out to any of the I teams or startups or people of the Sustainable Futures Challenge that you've been talking to and uh, hearing about today. All their email addresses are available on our website and also in the final little booklet uh, that we deliver to you. So if there's any way you think you want to contribute or if you have any questions or if you want to make any suggestions, of course, feel free uh, to talk to them. They're more than happy to talk to anybody who reaches out to them, I believe. So I think if the team is ready, uh, they're welcome to come to the stage.
would you guys prefer a revolving mic, like a handheld mic, or the stage, or this, this mic? Just the stage? Yeah, that's fine. Please. There's no laser pointer, unfortunately. We can only say next or back. Oh, so, so okay, give him a, a warming applause. Um, well, thank you. Um, we couldn't get the presentation up, so I'm just going to present the poster. Um, we had a very interesting challenge. Um, so, the question was, can we use hydrogen for? Uh, off-grid rural communities in developing countries. The very interesting challenge about this is we did not have the finished product, so the uh, inventors are still developing the technology. But they did set up the challenge because they have to know what's the future evolution in the market, so will their technology be useful? So the technology on the left uh, is an artificial photosynthesis, photosynthesis unit. What it basically does is it absorbs light, uh, there is water within that box, and it, uh, there's catalysis and uh, uh, solid surfaces on which basically what happens is the el water electrolysis, and the products of this um, box are hydrogen and oxygen. So then the question was, is there a current market for this type of technology? So we try to analyze in the developing countries uh, what would be the potential targets of this type of technology. Uh, so we do know that uh, energy access is a big problem in developing countries. Another big problem is the fact that uh, there is a widespread use of biomass. Burning biomass in indoor, in, uh, indoors uh, generates another problem, which is an indoor air quality problem that then generates a health problem. Uh, so we were trying to see if th combining these two problems or these two issues in developing countries, once, one was the energy access, which is also a service access, and also the, the potential for a new form of energy that would give, um, that would be able to provide a, a cleaner fuel than the current they're using for cooking. So would hydrogen be a substitute for, for these two types of users? Um, so we investigated three different scales. At household scale, we looked at the use of hydrogen for cooking. So we targeted specific areas where biogas, um, where biogas projects are already being implemented. And the question we were trying to answer is whether hydrogen could be used in the current infrastructure or a mix of hydrogen and biogas. So we found that um, there, are, there have been some applications in town gas in the UK and Germany where hydrogen was mixed with, bio, with not with biogas, but with methane, um, and was used in the, in the existing infrastructure. So that was one possibility. Uh, another possibility was the use of hydrogen as a um, standalone unit to provide different energy services to rural hospitals. So we investigated the possibility of using um, this, this type of device to provide hydrogen, and then in combination with uh, a fuel cell, and also in combination with a boiler, to provide things like um, hot water, electricity for different devices, and also a service that is very valuable for rural communities, which is oxygen. Currently, that's a big problem for rural hospitals and off-grid environments. Um, so the benefits are, of course, that it's a standalone unit. Uh, it is uh, sustainable in the, in the sense that it only uses water and uh, solar light. And it also the only thing that you'll be producing by burning hydrogen is water. So it's also sustainable in the sense that it doesn't produce greenhouse gas emissions. The third and the, third and the potential application that, that would be ready right now for the hydrogen is actually production of uh, biofuels, and in this, case, in this case is methanol, because there are already projects uh, in the developing world where they're using hydrogen to produce methanol. So in this case, this, the inventors could take their product, and it would be a direct substitution for the current way of producing methanol, which is using fossil fuels. So in their case, they would be substituting that by, by, a, by a sustainable and green solution, which would be hydrogen from clean sources. The other two uh, level, so the household and the rural hospital, all of this needs to be proven, so it needs to be set up somewhere, and you need to have a pilot project that would test out what are the operating conditions and what are the safety and maintenance needs of these types of systems. But the third one would be a direct application of what they have. And that's it. Thank you.
picture. Nelly, take a picture. Come, come, come. Big thank you to our project mentor, Lara Allen, the director of the Humanitarian Center as well. So a last stop for the competition. I know, no, it has been a long day, uh, but we want to do always too many things at the same time, I guess. That's maybe the nature of an entrepreneur as well. That might be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, Paul, would you please come to the stage and explain what has been going on with the 3D printing? So please welcome Paul from Ultimaker, who has been a strong supporter of our society as well. Good afternoon, or is it good evening now, I guess? Um, I'm not going to talk for long, guys. Just wanted to say it's a pleasure to be here, uh, give a little bit of a background about Ultimaker. We're a fully open source, um, open thinking, collaborative and community-driven company that shares 3D printing. And we believe that by giving people access to this technology, amazing things can happen. All of the applications for the 3D Printing Innovation Award were fantastic. We managed to filter that down to three today who have all given an elevator pitch and printed some of their models live on the printers uh, during the event. I'd like to say thank you to Jose, who's here from MIT, because without him, there couldn't have been uh, the level of an, an integrity of judging with his expertise. So thank you to Jose for assisting with that. Jerome, Jerome, I'm guessing with time, we're not going to get the guys up on stage and talk. Yeah? yeah. OK, right, so. You want to announce the winner? I think you should do the honor. Okay, well, um, it was a very close run thing and each of the projects had different values and uh, different aspirations, all of which we would like to support indirectly. But um, for us, there was a clear winner, partly based on philosophy, partly based on the applications of the design, and I think some real, really exciting points were raised by Jose that not only was the 3D printing and a delivery method to create the project, but they'd also gone one stage further and were actually getting people to build the 3D printers as part of the project. So if you guys would like to come to the stage, this is the $100 lab that you can see. And without doing them a, uh, an injustice, then very quickly, what the project does is makes a microscope accessible to everybody for less than $100, incorporating a Raspberry Pi, various 3D printing elements, and lots of developmental opportunities for both for the developed world and for the developing world. So, great job. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We've actually got the printer here for you, ready to take away. So. Great. We're standing. We got an ultimator too, which is awesome, right? Yeah. yeah. So, if any of you guys have exciting collaborations you want to discuss, please get in touch. We're all about supporting innovation. So, congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay. Well done. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, no. Say a few words. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Please. Okay. Please. So, um, I would like to thank the organizers and the judges of um, the competition, and also the other people who participated. Awesome project. Um, so I just want to make a little bit of an elevator pitch of an NGO that I'm working with, which is called Trend in Africa, where this whole thing started. So basically we're trying to teach the teachers, we're trying to teach people in um, sub-Saharan Africa basically how to make cheap and affordable and reliable science so that development comes from inside out and not from outside in. And with the big development of open source hardware, we could not, uh, not have a project on how to make cheap lab equipment, right? So what this is, is something that you can, if you learn very basic electronics and very basic uh, 3D printing models, you could make one of these for less than $100. Um, and this is what we've been doing actually. We go to Africa and we teach people how to make this. And by learning how to make this, they learn basic electronics. So from this, they can go to other projects and develop their own ideas and make their own tests for science. Right, so thanks again. And uh, there is a stand outside and hopefully I'll still have some minutes to uh, show you if anybody's interested and make some contacts and so on. Okay, thank you. So I uh, just wanted to say a couple words about the judging as well. So our two other uh, entries, uh, one was printing a heart valve um, and trying to develop a new, um, centrally, a custom made heart valve, which I think is awesome. And uh, the other one was printing a diagnostic, which you saw before. Um, they're great. Uh, actually, I would have invested in <laughs> all three. Um, and part of the reason we chose uh, the winner is because we think 
these, uh, that organization will create several more of those types of companies that are creating more heart valves and more diagnostics and many other types of things. And I mentioned earlier as well that uh, 3D printing is quite unsustainable. One of the things that I think it's key about the Altimaker is it's the open source philosophy. If we're going to change the, the, the sustainability of additive manufacturing in general, it's gotta come from the users. It usually comes from the open, uh, open source community, the actual users, user-driven innovation. And so this is how it's gonna happen, and that's part of the reason I agree to help judge and fully support what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Right. Cheers. Okay. Thank you so much.